Is it hot in here to anyone else? Feel good? Just to her? Anyone else? We'll, we'll adjust the temperature. If you guys get too hot, just start waving fans at yourself. We'll get it all squared away. You know, sometimes temperature adjustment in this building, it is a crapshoot, I'll tell you that. Yeah, you never know what's going to happen. So anyhow, let's get started with some prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for even the chance to have a facility, a building with heating and air. Uh, it's just a great experience that we get to have, a luxury that, um, you know, we don't deserve, like your grace that you provide anyhow. So we pray all this in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. So something you may not know about me is that, you know, just like my predecessor, I consider myself what's called a Christian skeptic, okay? Christian skeptic. Now, what that means is that there have been things, or there are things that are in the Bible that I go, uh, I don't know about all that, okay? I look at some things and I go, uh, I'm not so sure, Okay? I've been in class when I was studying for my, when I was getting my master's in divinity and I was in class and some of the stuff and I'd be like, I don't know how well I can trust that. Okay, that's skepticism. And if I just stopped there, if I just had these questions, okay, and if I never, if I just let that happen and let my brain stew in this disbelief, okay, I wouldn't amount to a whole lot. I really wouldn't. People that are skeptical a lot, that they don't search for the answers, they're the kind of the people that are, that um, they just like to complain. They don't like to fix anything. They just kind of want to like talk about a problem, but they don't want the solution. They, you, when you're a real skeptic, you search for the answer. You try to discover it. It's a part of the foundation of discovering truth. You know, when I, when I looked at scripture and I see, how in the world can some guy take a fish and feed 5,000 people with it. That's just ridiculous. I mean, how can some guy just take some water and turn it into wine? If that was true, we, you know, it, why hasn't he given us that ability and we'd have some pretty wicked parties these days, right? I have all kinds of wine. This can't be happening. This is sure, whatever. Now, like I said, if I just left it at that, those would be statements of disbelief. And the vast majority of people that say, oh, I'm just skeptical of the world, I'm skeptical of everything, when they say that they're atheist towards God or that they're agnostic towards God, meaning that they're not so sure, they come up with doubts and these questions, they'll, have, they'll, they'll just stop at that. They don't search. They don't want to try to understand. They'll come up with these questions and just move on without really caring about coming to an answer. They just, they just want to complain about things. But real skepticism, true skeptics, try or require, it requires the search for truth, true skepticism. It's a foundation. Like when you have someone that you, maybe you don't know or maybe you've never met before. I mean, recently there's been a whole lot of people going around knocking on doors for solar. Anybody got those door knockers about solar recently? Yeah, coming all the time. Now imagine if somebody came to your house and said, you know what? Mr. and Mrs. Jones, have I got a deal for you? I am here trying to sell timeshares for oceanfront property in Nebraska, okay? If you're, if you're just gullible, you'll say, great, that sounds awesome. But when you're a skeptic, you say, well, I don't know about that. I don't think that that's real, and it's not. I had to look it up myself. Where is Nebraska? And if you look, and you look at all of the borders of Nebraska, it's a thousand miles away from the nearest ocean. A thousand miles. The, the biggest body of water in Nebraska is a bathtub. There's nothing there. And so if, you, if someone came to your door and was like, hey, I got some of this oceanfront property, and you just accepted it as is, sometimes you would say that that person is trying to take advantage of you. But a skeptic will say, well, how do you, how, you know, how is that possible? There's no ocean near you. How is that possible? There's no timeshares like that. It doesn't exist. Skepticism, true skepticism, is pursuit of truth, okay? Christian skeptics are those that investigate the claims of the Bible through archaeology. They look at culture. They look at language. They look at all sorts of philosophy, uh, philosophy and, and geography, learning how to come to a reasonable conclusion about biblical claims. I'm a Christian skeptic, meaning that in my research, when I have those questions of like, I'm not so sure about that, I spend time, well, what do other people say about it? Is it possible to be true? 
And I look and I research and I go for what, uh, you know, what's common is beyond reasonable doubt. And that's what Christian skepticism is. You, you know, I wish that I had the faith like a child that the Bible wants us to have. It's just not how I'm wired. I question too many things. I want to know more. I want, it's exhausting, honestly, trying to research everything you, you come across. But it's not uncommon. The Bereans... This was a group of people that Paul had come to witness to. He went to the, he, they were a group of Jewish people. He went to their, to their synagogue in Berea, and what he found was as he was preaching Christ, the Messiah, that he had come, the gospel, to them, to the Jewish brethren, okay, in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, it says that the Bereans, they received the message with eagerness. They're like, okay, that sounds great. I, I, I see what you're saying, but... It continues and says that they examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. It's normal. It's a part of our experience in life. You know, people that say, oh, you can't have doubts in Christ and be a Christian. That's fooey, okay? If, if that's true, that you're not allowed to have questions or doubts or concerns or, you know, maybe even little uncertainties, if you're not allowed to have that, then are you saying that the, that the apostles, the disciples, were not Christians? Followers of Christ? Are you saying, like I mentioned a moment ago, that that, uh, doubting Thomas was not a Christian? I mean, look at the cross. If you don't know, most of the disciples, they left when Jesus was put on the cross. They bounced. They're like, all right, this guy's out. He's not real. He's being murdered. So they left. Are you saying that they're not real Christians? Of course you're not saying that. You know, it's a part of our experience, okay? And some of you today may be experiencing that, that first kind of skepticism, the one that the world has where it just wants to kind of just complain about things and not really search for an answer. If you're struggling with that, maybe you're a new believer and you don't understand certain things or maybe you've got questions and doubts of your own that you've been lasting over time. Without the pursuit of an answer, I'm going to tell you this right now, without truly trying to find the answer, you're going to miss out on one of the greatest experiences of the Christian life. One of the greatest experiences is called hope. If you don't look for it, if you don't you know, try to understand God in your life, you're going to miss out on this amazing experience. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. But for those who hope in the Lord, that's what I'm talking about, they will renew their strength. They'll become strong. They will soar on wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not be faint. Okay? That's an amazing promise. That with hope in the Lord that you will gain all of these things. That just in having hope in Christ, you'll you'll get the power to stand up against adversity. When things are going really, really tough. What is that saying? When the going gets tough, the tough get going, right? Right? This is what hope gives you, that you can overcome. You'll have that hope that kind of, that you, you feel confidence in, and you feel certainty in, and you'll feel as if, you know, everyone else, they may want to te- tear you down, they may want to call you names, they may want to do all these nasty things to you, but when you have the hope of Jesus Christ, you get to have this certainty and this uplifting feeling of, hey, it's going to be all right. Jesus is my guy. I don't have anything to worry about. You're going to get an endurance with you. You're going to have resiliency, okay? The 17th century pastor, Thomas Brooks, you know, when uh, England when all, when all England started to colonize America and they had a lot of the, the religious freedom people come over, you, we talk, heard about the Quakers and the Puritans, but, you know, American history. This is one of the Puritan pastors. His name's Thomas Brooks. And he said, a Christian will part with anything rather than hope. He knows that hope will keep the heart both from aching and breaking, from fainting and sinking. He knows that hope is a beam of God, a spark of glory, in other words, a light in the darkness, okay, and that nothing shall extinguish it, nothing. That's what the Christian has inside them. When they search for that answer, they discover this hope. They start to to see its flame develop inside their hearts. They start to see it rise. It's what Christians cling to. It's the whole thing. 
It's hope in Christ that drives our lives. It's the hope in Christ, the reason why you're here today. The reason why you've come, we've all come together. Because you know what the Bible calls hope? Faith. That's what it is. It's faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Okay? When you talk about having faith in Christ, it is the foundation of understanding the hope that he is. But I want to be clear, okay? Hope in Christ isn't some like new age thinking. It's not some positive psychology. It's not some blind trust thing that if you just, if you just tell the universe what will happen, it'll, it'll, it'll uh, come true, okay? This is not what we're talking about. Hope in Christ, it's confidence and assurance in what we can't see. And the, you know, us in this room, we're not at the foot of the, what's called the Mount of Beatitudes, where Jesus gave his famous sermon called the Beatitudes, right? Sermon on the Mount. This, we're not there. We're not at the empty tomb. We're not at the cross. We didn't see any of that stuff firsthand. However, we have faith in the truth of the apostles. We have faith in the truth of the Bible. We have faith in the truth of who Christ is. For those that have searched for those answers who decided, you know what? I don't know if that's true. I didn't think that's a bunch of baloney. But that have searched for the truth. They've discovered what real hope is. They found in the power of the Holy Spirit that we can have assurance in what Scripture tells us. We have faith that Jesus Christ is the Savior of mankind, even in the absence of all proof. That's what faith is. Everything in life has that element. You don't know how a chair works, yet you had faith when you sat down that that sucker was going to hold you up. You may not know all the chemical compositions of the steel that they used or all the different formulations for the weaving of the materials, but you believe that it was going to hold you up. That's faith. You don't have to have all the data. You just have to hope in who Christ is. Tori Ten Boom, I mentioned her last week. She said, faith sees the invisible, believes the unbelievable, and receives the impossible. Remember what I said earlier? But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles, and they will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. That's supernatural stuff. It's not natural for a human to always be able to just run for eternity. They can't do that. They'll eventually run out of energy. It's not natural for us to be able to have full endurance or have total you know, resilience and you know, not grow faint. It's totally outlandish to think of ourselves literally on a, on a uh, riding on the wing of an eagle. Besides, that'd be a really big eagle for me if, to, to support that wing. But that's the point. It's about believing in the impossible. It's about experiencing that. Human hope, human hope, that's just, ah, I'm not so sure if that's going to work out. That's what human hope is. Okay? It's, it's, I don't know if it's going to work out because, you know, I'm not sure it's going to happen and, you know, I really don't think they're going to come through or I don't think this is going to work or what have you. That's, that's human hope. I hope this works out. Christian hope is just the opposite. Yes, it's the same word, but we're not hoping in uncertainty. Christian hope is, I live in this state of hope that this is going to work out because I know God will make it happen. Okay? That's the difference. One says, I don't know because I'm not sure if it's going to happen. One says, I'm not sure, but I know God's going to make it happen. That's the difference in the hope. I don't know when, I don't know how, but I have hope in the invisible. I believe in the unbelievable, and because of that, I will experience the impossible. There was this experiment done. Uh, Science researchers, they wanted to know about this concept is hope real is that something that we can be tangible is hope something that you can understand so they does anyone like rats in here anyone like rats okay good this story is not going to bother you all right so researchers they took some rats and they put them in a tub of water and what they did is they put them in the tub of water and if you've ever seen a rat in water they'll they'll swim 
okay? So what the researchers did is they, they put the rats in the water, and then they left for an hour. And when they came back, they saw that the rats had drowned. But then they had a second group of rats. They put them in a tub, and it had water in it. And what the science researchers did is that when they put them into the water, and then they'd leave for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then they'd come back, and they'd pick the rats up out of the water, let them recover, let them rest for a second, okay? Then they'd put them back, and they'd walk away. And every 15 minutes, they'd come back, pick them up, right? Through their struggle, they'd pick them up and let them rest, let them relax, put them, and then they'd put them back. And they did this for an entire hour, just kept coming back and picking them up out of the water, picking them up out of the water. And after the hour, they just left the rats alone. They came back, and guess what? The rats were still swimming. The next day, they were still swimming. Why? Because they had hope. They kept believing that there was going to be somebody that was going to come and rescue them. They had true faith. In the absence of seeing the researchers, they believed that there was going to be someone who was going to rescue them. They didn't have, it wasn't because, the difference isn't because they got out and were rested for that hour. They didn't have secret powers. It was because they suddenly had hope in themselves. Not in their own abilities, but that someone was going to be there for them. They had faith that they could just stay afloat just a little bit longer. Someone would reach down and rescue them. They swam, you know, like I said, 24 hours. That's power. That's strength. That's experiencing the impossible. And if the hopes of a little rat can keep them swimming for 24 hours, imagine imagine you having the hope of Christ in you. Imagine what you can accomplish. Imagine what you can experience. I mean, because the opposite is that you live in a state of despair. You live in this state of depression. You live in this state of, you know, uh, you know problems. And I get it. You guys may not know this, but I, I, I have challenges with PTSD. And part of that means that I have moments of anxiety and I have moments of depression. I've been there. I know what that feels like. And it's hope is that what helps bring me out of it. And hope will help bring you out of it too. Theologian Thomas Fuller once said, great hope makes great men. Great hope makes great men, but I'm going to add something to it. Great hope makes great men because great men hope in a great God. That's what gives them strength. Not just hope in just whatever. It's because we hope in the one true thing that can be our rescuer, our redeemer. Romans chapter 15, Paul's talking you know, to the church, and he's saying, the church of Rome, and he's trying to say, may the God of hope, this is the great power of God, fill you with all joy and peace in the believing process, all right, in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. It's joy and peace that are, you know, you gain from this hope. When you feel like you're never going to be, you know, put down, when you feel like you're never going to have to deal with some of the, excuse me, challenges in life, with the attitude of, oh, I'm just going to fail all the time, changes your whole attitude. This is the hope in our Redeemer, hope in our Savior, hope that His return brings our long-awaited reconciliation between heaven and earth. For millennia, okay, millennia means thousands of years, right? The Israelites were waiting on the Messiah, the promised one. Okay? They were waiting for God to send the Messiah, the rescuer, all right, to uh, pull their, the people away from oppression, to get them out of this season of, of hurts and, and pains. They, you know, they were waiting for so long to, ha- to see this, this uh, redeeming love of God in the form of this Savior. They were waiting so long they actually missed him. They missed his coming. This whole idea of them, you know, they, they had no reason to not notice. They saw him around. They talked with him. They met with him. He went before councils. They watched him perform miracles. They watched him do all sorts of healing. And they watched all these proofs. They witnessed it firsthand. And yet they still missed him and put him on a cross. 
They're still waiting on this first coming or advent. I shared that with you guys before. Advent means come, Lord. It's this wanting. It's this desire. It's this anticipation. Come, Lord. And for them, they're still in one sense of Advent. For us, for Christians who know the truth of the Messiah and what he's done and the work that he's brought onto the cross, that this hope, we get that hope. That one's good. We're set there. God fulfilled his promise. So that means the hope of his return is going to happen. I know God's going to do that. He's already done this first one. There ain't no way he's going to mess, mess, uh, mess up this one. He's always fulfilled his promises. Every time we look back, we see that God has fulfilled. And so what we do is we wait in a state of patience. Romans chapter 8, Paul again said, For in this hope we are saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for something they already have? But if we hope for what we do not have yet, we wait in patience. We wait in that same Advent you know, uh, time. That's what this whole ceremony or experience or church tradition, whatever you want to call it is. It's not a Catholic thing. It's not an Assemblies of God thing. It's not a Baptist thing. It's not a Lutheran thing. It's a heart thing. It's a hard time of, you know, yeah, we got Christmas and we're awaiting presents or waiting, you know, fa- uh, time with family. Sure, yeah, that's r- really good stuff. But this is a time to reflect in the come, Lord, experience. We celebrate the already and the not yet. The already is that he's come once. The not yet is his return. We get to have two celebrations. One of his birthday and one when his return comes. And I know that that, for a lot of people, especially those that are skeptic, it's going to sound ridiculous, all of what I just said. You know, it's hard to put some of those things into perspective, especially if it's the first time you've ever heard things like this. But hope is something we do in life. It's a theme. We do it every day. We hope we're going to get paid. We hope we're going to have enough money. We hope that we're going to be able to have, you know, experience real love, true love. We hope that, you know, we're going to have a full life. We hope that we're going to be able to see God's creation in its fullest. We have hope for this. And without the hope in Jesus, we end up just like those rats, drowning. We get caught up in disappointment. We get caught up in despair and these clouds of darkness. And it's not until we understand the light of hope and who Christ is, the light of the world, can we ever get out of that. Can we ever start to heal our hearts and heal our minds and get them to a place of certainty? James Ahi said, hope is the last lingering light of the human heart. It shines when every other is put out. Extinguish it. And the gloom of suffering becomes the very blackness of darkness, miserable and impenetrable. Some of you in this room or listening to this message have had some very serious things in your life try to extinguish the hope in your heart. You've gone through some very serious health issues. You've gone through some serious relational issues. You've lost parents, loved ones. You might be someone who's struggling with addiction, that you don't have the hope that you're ever going to overcome that. Maybe you're struggling with people letting you down in life. Maybe you're stressed out. You're not going to be able to afford Christmas this year. This time of year can be hard. I know for many, many years this was hard on me. Christmas was a tough time. But it was because I treated hope like a wish. Oh, I just wish I could have this. Oh, I just wish I could have that or it would be different. I wish all of these things. If I just had a genie and he would fulfill my wishes, all things would be better. I was waiting on someone or something to grant the wishes of my heart. And that's not how this life works. But the hope of God isn't a wish. It's not dependent on other people. It's not made in some factory. It's not something you can travel to. Instead, biblical hope is faith in action, fueling confidence that God fulfills his promises. 
Matthew chapter 4, verse 16. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. There is a light to this world that I know that some of you may have a hard time seeing right now, but it's there. I promise. But you're not going to see it until you look for it. The light of God that he wants you to see today is a light of hope. And like I said earlier, maybe you've you know, ne- had challenges with it. Maybe you've never experienced it. Maybe you've never felt its warmth. So today, as we close this up very quickly, I want to cover five things to help you strengthen your hope in Christ this holiday season. Okay, so real quick, five things. Number one, the primary thing, primary characteristic of a disciple, the, pr- the number one experience is to learn to worship. It's the number one thing. Jesus said it's the number one uh, uh, commandment. Love the Lord God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. Okay? So number one, seek God's heart. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But first, or excuse me, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek him, and you will have fulfillment. Seek him and you're going to feel safe. Seek him and you're going to have hope unlike anyone else in this world who's looking at all of the wars and the pestilence and the sin and all the challenges and just feeling just crummy all the time. And they're feeling, you know, like the world, you know, chicken little, world's falling down, right? Everything's going bad, you know, uh, things are terrible. If you spend your time focusing on all the stuff that's bad, you're going to miss what is amazing. You're going to miss the hope of Christ because you're spending so much time looking at all the stuff that the world is. When you seek the heart of God, you're developing an attitude, okay, a habit of alone time with God. This is a perfect season for that. Dark a little bit longer. Things are a little quieter. Sometimes we put fires on in the house. This is perfect time for you to have alone time with God where you just let all the other things kind of just go to the wayside for a little bit and you just talk with God. That's it. You just say, hey, Lord, I'm here. I'm sitting. I don't want to think about anything else but you. I'm here to talk. And that's it. Just let it happen. Experience him. Just let your mind, you know, pray to him and communicate with him. Tell him what you're happy about. Tell him what you're discouraged about. Let him be the one that guides the conversation. All you got to do is just let it happen. It's about developing this alone time, removing yourself from noise and connecting with God on a personal level. Psalm chapter 147, verse 11. The Lord delights in those who fear him. This fear is not like scared. This is fear is in respect. Fear is in developing habits of connection. Like I want to be a part of him. Okay. And the verse says, who put their hope in his unfailing love. The Lord wants to pour out his love wisdom, comfort, and hope to you in moments where everything else feels hopeless. But what it takes is attention towards him. Number two, you need to be patient while you're seeking. Be patient in the waiting. Hebrews chapter 10, let us hold on to the hope we say we have and not be changed. We can trust that God or trust God that he will do what he has promised. One of the foundational elements or characteristics of that term hope is patience. It's waiting. It's readiness to experience an answer, a solution, or some change in life. And sometimes we get it kind of twisted, right? That silence from God. If we don't experience change right away or if we don't have what we want immediately, then all of a sudden, oh, God doesn't love me or God's trying to punish me. God's trying to, you know, do something wrong or I've done something wrong to God and now I have to suffer the consequences. And sometimes that may be true. But for the vast majority of our experience, the sil- you know, sometimes, you know, e- every day in patience is a day set for change within and work to be done. Every time you're in that degree of silence, it's another moment for you to reflect on the work that God wants to, for, to happen in your heart. When you want to have a quality relationship with God, you have to have patience in your life. We just had Thanksgiving. Anybody ever had a a, a deep fried turkey before? 
All right, good. I was the only fatty in first service, okay? Anyone ever had a Traeger turkey or a slow roasted turkey? What about a deep pit turkey? Ever had one of those? They're amazing. Deep pit, if you don't know what it is, they basically throw a turkey into a hot pit and leave it (laughs) until the next day. And when it comes out, though, it's amazing. It's so tender. It's juicy. It's probably one of the best turkeys you've ever had in your life. It's amazing. You can do it with any kind of meat, but it takes time. Yeah. You can put a turkey in a microwave, and it'll be done real quick, but it is not going to taste as good as that deep pit, is it? Because it takes time. It takes maturity. It takes patience in it. Number three, don't neglect the wisdom of others. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. He who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. This idea that when we experience something from Christ, when we get something from God, the gifts that we are given, that they're only for us, is a, a, a misunderstanding of, the, uh, of Scripture. Every gift that we're given is to be given to, uh, to someone else. Every gift that you have in your body, your talents, your time, your treasure, is not for you. It's to bless other people with. You're just the vehicle. You're the vessel. And if you're not doing a good job at being compassionate with others, you're not being, doing a good job of being loving with others, forgiving with others, then you're not being a very good vessel and steward with your time here on earth. You want to be someone who cultivates this character of Christ in your life. And that's why it's so important to get involved in a connect group. Right now, we're kind of coming into a close in our season. So next year, in January, when you're making your resolutions, one of them is going to be for everyone in this church, every one of you, I want you to get into a connect group next year. And I'll have some more information about that when that's coming out, and it's going to be really great for you and your family, I promise. But that's where you learn how to have comfort or, and to be comforted by those around you. You're not going to feel that here. You're really not. You're just coming here. This is the, this is the point of the time in the temple where we're learning God's Word. But then to put it into practice is where you learn how to have comfort and be comforted. you got to listen to the wisdom of others. you got to put yourself around people that have been through circumstances in life. Every one of you has a story. You've been put through something. Maybe you've gone through the loss of a loved one. And your your story of, hey, I held on to hope in Christ and he pulled me through. You can share that with someone else. You know, maybe you've gone through the experience of bankruptcy. Like, hey, I know you're struggling financially, but my hope in Christ kept me afloat and I've made it through. It's all right. Yeah, it was tough, but I'm okay. Maybe you've gone through, you know, divorce. or Maybe you've gone through some other challenging experiences in life. There are people in this room right now that need to hear that story, and the only way you're going to get it is in a connect group. Number four, you got to remember what God's already done. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the Scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have When we see the promises, when we study His Word, when we even look at the people around us and the lives changed and the experiences that that God has pulled us through from the past, that should ignite in you another flame of hope. It should add more wick to the candle. It should add more fuel and say, you know what? I may not feel it today, but I know God provided for me in the past, so I'm going to hope on to that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to just jump onto that the best I can because I know he's fulfilled his promises once and he's going to do it again. Number five, expect setbacks to turn into comebacks. Okay? James chapter one, verse six. Okay? You must have faith as you ask him. All right? Because he says, James, my favorite book in the Bible James talks about how if you don't have wisdom, if you don't understand what you need to be doing in life, you need to ask God. He gives freely. He will give to you. But James says right here, you must not doubt. He's not talking about having uncertainty. What he's talking about is being hesitant. Like if you're going to ask God, you better, you better hold on. Because God is going to put something into your life. He's going to do something. He's going to use that experience in life to create something new through it. 
So if you're going to ask him for wisdom, you better hold on to your bucket because you're about to get something. If you're going to ask him for a new experience in life, you better hold on. It may not be when you want it. It may not be how you want it. But he is going to provide just as he always has. You got to expect that that setback is going to get better. You're going to, you have to expect that the troubles that you're in, that no matter the outcome, God's going to use it for good. He's going to bring goodness out of you and your life. That's the hope, isn't it? It's the hope knowing that we don't know the future. We don't really know what's going to happen tomorrow. But we have faith that God's going to care. We have faith that God's going to turn it around. We have faith that he's going to carry us through. We don't need to see it all the time. We don't need to have it paraded around our house. We don't need to, you know, uh, have all sorts of reminders everywhere because we have it in our heart. It's that light, that flame of hope. It exists in our hearts. And that's what we hope on to. We don't need all the extras. As a Christian, our hope, as George Herbert says, He that lives in hope is one that dances without music. You don't need to have all the certainties. Someone who lives in hope doesn't need to have all of the answers done, doesn't have have to have all the proof. They have confidence and assurance it's going to work out no matter what. That's what the season of Advent's about. For so many years, everyone doubted. They didn't believe it. And yet it came. For us, the season of Advent is not hoping for the first time. It's hoping for the next one. Knowing that God has fulfilled his promise once, he'll do it again. And he'll do it again. And he'll do it again. And he'll do it again. I want you to hear this final song. And I know that there's going to be lyrics on the screen. And I know that we have, you know, it's going to be, you know, melodious around us. It's going to be melody. But the thing is, if we always expect to hear God and all the giant noises of life and, you know, all the music and stuff, we're going to miss out on the most important experience you'll ever have as a Christian. And the best picture of this is Elijah, okay? Elijah, he went and he wanted to hear God. And throughout all of the earthquakes and all of the fire and the flames and when all of this destruction was going on, he was waiting to see God in all of it trying to say, how in the world are you going to make all this work out, God? He wanted to feel it. He wanted to understand God. And do you know when he finally heard him? When he sat still. Because God speaks in a still, small voice. It was once we let all the noise go away that it was finally time for uh, Elijah to hear God's voice. And it's time for you. I know that we have a song and it's going to be things that are around us, but I hope that the lyrics were there to remind you to remind you of the trust that you've had, the belief that you have, the faith that you have, the hope that you have. So I want you to bow your heads, close your eyes. And as we prepare to hear this final song, I just want you to let your heart be open. You may still be skeptical. You may not be so sure. All I ask is that your hope, your heart is open and ready to hear. Because I promise you this, God has something to say to you today. Heavenly Father, as so many of us have waited in this season of Advent, this hope, we just can't wait for you to rescue us. Give us, give us a little bit. Give us a little reminder. Show us in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls, times that you've already been that Redeemer. You've already turned our story into something good. That you've already been there and and sustained us through the the hardships. Help us reignite that flame of hope. Give us more fuel. Give us more wax. Give us more, you know, uh, wick. Whatever it takes. Lord, we come before you as hopeful people. Some of us might be on its way out, but we're still here. And so, Lord, we desperately put ourselves before you, bring ourselves before your throne, and we ask for refreshment, rejuvenation, restoration. We know you're going to do it. You've done it before. 
We just want to see you do it again. We pray all this in your son's name, Jesus Christ.
those that may be finding it hard to see you as the way maker in their life, someone who is always working. I ask for this moment to be a catalyst. Maybe it's the spark that they've been waiting for, to hear your word, to experience your spirit, to see others that are devoted to you, even through the hardship. Lord, if they're here this morning and are uncertain of your love, my prayer is that they understand that without your mercy, without your grace, without your salvation, they will never experience true joy, true peace, true hope, a true life. We'll pause in this prayer, and if that's you, you've been struggling with what tomorrow is going to bring, anxieties, worries, and you don't know who Christ is, I want to invite you to just accept him. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't need to know all the special, you know, there's no special prayer. There's no special class you have to go to. All you have to say is, Lord, I'm tired of the way that I've been living. I'm tired of, you know, as your word calls it, sin, living in sin, away from you. And I want answers. I don't want to be a skeptic. I want to be, a, I want to be someone who's searching for true answers and knowing your truth. I know that the only way I'll be able to experience that is by accepting you into my life. So I open my heart to you today in hope of your salvation of my soul. If you prayed that prayer or you just followed along with me and you really meant that in your heart, please let me know. Put it on your keeping in touch card. Circle that yes that's on there. Let somebody in your family know. Let somebody next to you know that that's, where, that's your new journey. That's your next step. So you want to be a true Christian skeptic. Discovering the truth of Christ. For the rest of us. Let us accept the hope of Christ as one that fuels us for tomorrow. That fuels our desires. That fuels our thoughts. Let it be the light in our own darkness so that we can be the light to someone else. We pray all this in your son's name, Jesus Christ, and everyone said, amen. All right, guys, I look forward to seeing you next Sunday as we continue with Advent. I'll see you then.